Children everywhere love to play and explore. It's an intrinsic part of child and adolescent development. Children in emergencies are confronted by physical dangers which kill and injure them. As humanitarians, we must take action on this under-recognized issue. This video is part of a series exploring the minimum standards for child protection in humanitarian action, or CPMS, which are key for all humanitarians as we work to fulfill our duties towards children. This video examines Standard 7, Dangers and Injuries. After a crisis, it's important for things to get back to normal. Play and curiosity are necessary for recovery. Surrounded by chaos and distraction, girls and boys seek out new places to play and new ways to carry out their daily tasks. Many emergencies lead to children being displaced into new environments or needing to navigate altered contexts where there are heightened physical dangers. These dangers will vary by situation and often by age. However, Careful consideration should always be given to children with disabilities and the under fives. Children's safety within these new environments is often made worse by inadequate supervision. Sara has been working for an NGO as a child protection officer for five years. Recently, fighting broke out in her area. The organization set up a program to help children affected by the emergency and her responsibilities are changing. Using the findings from the initial multi-sector assessment, Sarah and her colleagues decide to prioritize child-friendly spaces and family separation. After talking to a health colleague a few weeks later, Sarah realizes that a large number of children are being injured in their daily activities. She is struck by how dangerous the IDP camp is for children and that many boys and girls are getting hurt. When the child protection sector starts to organize a more in-depth assessment, she lobbies to include something about physical dangers. Her colleagues disagree as they feel it doesn't relate to violence, exploitation, abuse and neglect. Sarah is adamant, however, as she knows that children are unintentionally killed and injured frequently in the emergency setting. To her, this directly underscores the life-saving nature of child protection. To bolster her argument, she turns to the CPMS and their 10 guiding principles. These must be the basis of our efforts. Child protection minimum standard to dangers and injuries help us to design the assessment and identify the children who are in need, as well as the risks present in the communities to the children. Standard 7 states, all children and caregivers are aware of and protected against injury, impairment and death from physical and environmental dangers and children with injuries and or impairments receive timely physical and psychosocial support. The standard highlights drowning, falling, burns, road traffic, wild animals, sharp objects, exposure to hazardous waste, damaged infrastructure, weapons, and explosive remnants of war, including landmines. It's very important that child protection actors should collect age and gender appropriate information as well as the specific risks present in the community, which may cause dangers and injuries for the children. Returning to Sarah's experience, she realizes that girls and boys are concerned about a wider range of dangers than her team has previously considered as the NGO has the child-friendly spaces already set up, the workers think this is a great opportunity to discuss the issue further with children. Here is an example of such work in Pakistan. We did consultations with children, we did focus group discussions where they did some community risk mapping, but they also did focus group discussions about what were the biggest dangers for them in their communities. Um, and it was really interesting, we separated the boys and the girls um, and we separated the age groups as well. And they spoke about how their environment, environment has completely changed and how they um, were more exposed to being out and isolated in areas that they didn't normally play in that had completely changed because of the floods. So there was a lot of water around, they maybe didn't have the ability to swim or they were worried about other animals, snakes. 
um, and also just about being isolated. Data from different sources needs to be collated and compared to identify the patterns and extent of dangers. As child protection actors, we need to draw on the monitoring systems of colleagues in sectors such as health, shelter, and camp management. A joint, robust analysis is vital for advocacy, awareness raising, and prevention efforts. We can do assessments where we gather this information about what dangers there are for children, and we can really take this as an opportunity to pass that to other sectors and really embed things into their programming. So we have to be super strong in making sure that we're at other cluster meetings, that we're going in, we're speaking to the key actors who can help with dangers and safety. There's also need to have a very strong referral mechanism with the engagement of different organizations as well as other sectors. Addressing dangers and injuries needs the strong commitment of a range of actors. In collaborating with different government and non-governmental actors, Sarah realizes that common procedures would provide clarity. So together, they integrate dangers and injuries into existing humanitarian interventions, including child protection itself, camp management, and WASH. They start the dialogue by focusing on the principle of do no harm. Here is what actually happened in one IDP camp after two children fell into a badly constructed pit latrine and died. So we really worked with the WASH sector um, to do an assessment on the communities involving women, children, um, uh, the parents, boys and girls on where they've been playing and what they felt the dangers were. But what did they think the strategies were to try and make a safer community? So we went through some of those options and the WASH sector from this, they, they put in a much more thorough uh, monitoring system of the pit latrines. They were out every day checking the quality of the, the construction and amending it where, where needed. But also for us, our child protection groups were starting to report to the camp management committees. We did incident reporting um, and they really took down all the data. And we used that data to, to check if things were improving using a strategy and actually they were. In Sarah's context, the Child Protection Coordination Group decides that community-based structures, child-friendly spaces, and case management are its best entry points. The case management task team revises its standard operating procedures so that injured and disabled children could more easily access the referral mechanism and suitable services. Sarah's team works hard to improve the child-friendly spaces they run. They want to make them safer as well as more inclusive for children with new or pre-existing disabilities and injuries. Redesigned activities reach parents and children with prevention strategies. Mine Action colleagues work with the children to recognize those dangers and how to keep safe. The team facilitates discussions between community leaders, women's groups, and parents and children who decide to take further action. They go into the community and supervise the places where children play, guiding them to safer areas. They also use religious sermons and community theater to promote key messages. Here's one example of how a displaced community reacted to a children's performance to raise awareness. It described an incident where a young child died after being left unattended next to a fire. And after that, a woman took the floor and said, in Sango, the local language, this job of sanitization, of taking care of children or watching after children to avoid danger, and injuries to them is not the business of women only. It's the business of also men and everybody in the community should be involved so that we can avoid putting children in danger. And she said, girls or boys, they shouldn't be the one that are cooking or are doing the job at the place of the men and the women and the, and the elders. As part of her casework, Sarah encounters a nine-year-old boy with a complex fracture. When his father was killed in the fighting, he had started to work in a garage to support his mother and younger sisters. There, he had broken his shoulder. His exhausted mother tells how he is in pain, crying at night and unable to leave the tent. His physical and psychological distress are clear. Sarah works with the community health team to provide the boy with better pain management. 
As his trust in her grows, he is able to talk with her about his more difficult experiences. After a few weeks, he welcomes a visit from members of the children's club and eventually starts to attend himself. Sarah is also able to refer the family to a livelihoods project that has a child care component, which means the boy's mother could work. It is important to note that injury encompasses both visible and invisible impact on children. So, humanitarian actors need to work for both physical and mental injury that children have experienced. Sada's experience taught her that the emergency created new physical risks and exacerbated old ones. It also affected families' ability to cope with the changed environment. However, she realized that community members of all ages were best placed to identify risks and provide solutions to improve children's safety. Protecting children lies at the heart of humanitarian action. Learn more by visiting the website of the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action, the global interagency network that promotes the protection and well-being of children in humanitarian settings.